Okay, good morning. I think we'll start. So my name is Susan Buckle. I'm the Space Careers Lead at the UK Space Agency. It's wonderful for you all to join us this morning. I think we're going to have a great hour or so um, listening to our panel and obviously you've got a great chance to ask some questions. So I'm delighted you could all join us. Just to let you know, this session is being recorded. Um, you, the schools and the students, obviously we can't see you anyway. Um, on the screen. So um, if anyone has an issue with that, then I'm afraid you might want to leave the um, session, but hopefully you're all here um, and happy for that to happen. And um, you know, please put any comments or anything in the chat function. If you've got any questions whilst I'm talking, while the panel's talking, please pop them in the Q&A part um, of this webinar and we will get to them at the end. So hopefully you're all here because you have some interest in joining the space sector or are looking at it as a potential career after school or university or whatever your plans are. Um, and if so, you're about 10 steps ahead of me when I was your age. So I'm really impressed you're already um, looking at different careers and um, in particular looking at the space sector. So I took quite an unconventional route into the sector. It's not all engineering and maths and physics, although we have some fantastic uh, maths and physics graduates here with us today on the panel. But I actually studied psychology at university, um, so never intended to join the space sector, but I was always interested in flying. I got my pilot's license when I was 17 years old, studying my A-levels, but as I said, then decided to go to university to study psychology instead. Um, and after that, I became a teacher. So hello to the teachers out there um, and became head of psychology, but then decided to go back to university um, to do my master's at Cranfield in human factors in aeronautics. So that's kind of bringing all the psychology side of things, um, a bit of ergonomics um, in terms of cockpit design and things like that into um, the aeronautics um, industry. And whilst I was at Cranfield, I saw a job advert for the European Space Agency to become one of the astronaut instructors in something called human behavior and performance. So you might have heard of things like soft skills or interpersonal skills. And it was all about teaching the astronauts and the ground control crew and all the astronaut instructors um, the um, kind of psychology behind, you know, good communication, good teamwork, good situation awareness, all those things that are important when you're um, conducting a space mission with astronauts on the International Space Station. Uh, so that was over at the European Astronaut Centre in Cologne in Germany, and I had a fantastic five years there. It was great fun. Um, but in 2015, I decided to move back to the UK. Um, because Tim Peake was launching to the International Space Station. So I hope you've all heard of Tim. I do sometimes talk to people nowadays that haven't because um, it was six years ago now, but um, Tim Peake's our British um, astronaut. So yeah, he went up to the space station for six months and I came back to the UK um, to work for the UK Space Agency, helping to run their education program and um, creating lots of resources and workshops um, to get youngsters interested in, um, in studying science and potentially working in the space sector. And that's where I've stayed for the last six years. And it's been great fun, worked on lots of different projects um, to do with going to Mars and um, the James Webb telescope and all those kind of things. So that's kind of a little, a brief history of how I got into the space sector. And I've got a fantastic panel that um, all came into the sector from different ways or work in different areas in the sector. So I hope it will just give you a really good taste of um, the different careers out there and the kind of the potential things that you might want to do. So as I said, whilst the panel is talking, please put any questions you have in the Q&A. If you just want to ask in general, that's fine. Um, if you want to take a note of their names and ask them specific questions, then if you could put that in the questions, that would help me afterwards to ask the right people the right questions. So without further ado, I'm going to actually, I'm going to introduce you first all to Daisy Richardson. Um, I will let her explain how she got um, to where she is today. Um, but um, yeah, I'll pass over to Daisy first of all. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, so I actually got into the space industry in um, a very unexpected way. I, first of all, was really interested in physics and maths um, at 
at GCSE level I only really started to get interested in it then before then I had no clue what I wanted to do really I think I wanted to be a vet for a very long time um and then once I did my GCSEs I started studying a GCSE in astronomy which I really enjoyed so then I kind of thought right I think I want to study physics or astrophysics at uni um and I went on to sixth form, studied maths, further maths and physics, and was still convinced that I just wanted to go to university, join like a research group afterwards, um, possibly study for a PhD. But in sixth form, I actually um, joined the CANSAT team, so the 2018 CANSAT competition, um, and I took part in that for my school. And it was so fun, such a good experience. I was the only girl in the team, but everyone was so inclusive of me. Um, so friendly and welcoming so we competed at the UK competition in York and we won so we were the first people from my school to win the CANSAT competition and I really enjoyed that um, and then we went and competed in the Azores in the European competition um, where I met loads of people from different countries and got a real feel for what it was like to work within the space industry then after that, I went to university, got the grades I needed to study physics with astrophysics at the University of Leeds um, and kind of started to realise I didn't really want to go into academics. I was I'm missing what I had in the space industry when I was working for Can the CANSAT competition. Um, so I started looking at routes in and there's actually so many careers that I just didn't realise existed. I went to the 2019 space conference and found some there that I was interested in. Um, and then recently I was part of a SPIN internship, which is an internship in the space industry. And I worked on uh, engineering origami for a origami space habitat. And then from then on, I was like, I don't even want to go and do a master's. I had plans to do a master's this year in London, but I decided, no, I'm just having too much fun. <laughs> so I decided to stay with BT Space. And this is actually my first week not an intern uh, working with them and I'm really enjoying it now I'm part of the analysis team working on trajectories and uh, analysis to do with the flights. Thank you Daisy and yeah I had the pleasure of meeting Daisy a couple of times over summer um, while she was doing her internship and it's just such great news that you've now got a job um, with them which is obviously the um, ultimate aim so thank you Daisy and as I said everyone obviously if you've got some questions for Daisy pop them in the chat now and I'll get um, to them after we've um, met all our panel but please do start asking questions. Thank you Daisy uh, and next we've got David Warden. Good morning and first of all before people realise I am Scottish so if you have any questions about what I say please just put it in a box because I understand that I might be quite hard to pick up but anyway unlike most people in the space industry I didn't go directly from uh, to university I actually went and did an apprenticeship first at a company based in Glasgow called Clyde Space and I wasn't really aware of the space industry in Scotland or even the UK at that time it came up an ad in a local paper of mine uh, for an apprenticeship in an industrial boiler cleaner. But I applied I applied for it because of my grades weren't exactly amazing and I didn't think I'd make it into university, so I applied for it there. And it was actually a recruiting company that had a bunch of different companies looking for apprentices, and Clydespace was one of them. So I did the interview with Clydespace, really liked it, but at the time there was only, I think, 18 people working at the time, which is now, it's now a company of 100. So when I first applied, I did an apprenticeship and moved into what was electrical test. So we build, we work in building really small satellites called CubeSats, which are probably about the size of a shoebox. So when I first started, we did standard products like batteries and stuff for just controlling the power in a satellite. So I originally worked testing them and just making sure they're all right before they're out the door. But as time grew on and I started to really understand the job in a bit more, I really want to develop further into the space industry. So when I finished my four year apprenticeship, I then went and did a university degree in mechanical engineering part-time while also working at Clyde Space, which has led me to develop further and to actually join the mechanical design team for where I work now. But through my time in Clyde Space, I've been exposed to a lot of different things. I've traveled all over the world. I've been to Florida to help integrate satellites. 
I've been down south in England to do environmental test campaigns, just shaking satellites, make sure they all work okay. And even to this point now where the Queen recently visited AC Clyde Space and I was one of the selected few to actually speak to. So a career in space might be far out there, but it definitely has its perks. And it doesn't mean you have to go straight from school to university or even get the grades because I'm a prime example of that. You don't need to and still make a very quite successful career. So thank you. Great. And yeah, I know that Tim Peake has also said a few times how he didn't get the uh, the best grades <laughs> he could have. But yeah, so there's and he also, same as you, David, um, went in and did uh, and did his um, his degree whilst um, after he'd started work as well. So you're in good hands, in good in a good team. Thank you. Um, and so next up, we've got Mamatha, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hello, good morning. Uh, I'm, I'm Mamata Mahesh I'm one of the senior systems engineers at RAL Space. Um, who we are, we are uh, UK's National Space Laboratory. We are part of Science and Technologies Facilities Council, uh, which is one of the councils within UK Research and Innovation. Uh, we, we do a wide variety of things. Um, mainly, it, our focus is on the design and development of the instruments. Uh, so we have flown over 210 instruments um, on different missions. Some of the very famous missions like Solar Orbiter, um, which was launched early uh, this year. And then there is uh, MIRI, an instrument called MIRI on James Webb Space Telescope, which was uh, designed and developed at RAL. And also there is uh, uh, there are future missions like Aerial and Lagrange and others. So we do a lot of research, uh, um, astronomy, solar physics and climate. And there is a lot of technology development going on in optics, thermal and electronics uh, components and modules. And we have wide range of facilities uh, such as uh, ground stations and uh, uh, calibration facilities, environmental test facilities, and one of the biggest ones uh, recently is the National Satellite Test Facility, which you might have heard um, if you're listening to UK Space Conference quite a few times, um, which will be the UK's one-stop shop for assembling and testing the space payloads up to 7,000 kilograms. So it will have clean rooms in it. There will be large space test chambers, which can actually fit mini bus sized satellites. And there will be vibration facilities, shock facilities, acoustics, etc. So in my day-to-day -day job, uh, I am the technical lead on an international research-led uh, satellite project, for, which is between Singapore and the UK. And uh, that is a technology demonstration satellite, which will be sending quantum photons from space to ground. So this is a demonstration of quantum key distribution from space to ground. So what I do in my, how I got into space is, um, I come from India, so I did my bachelor's there. So I did electronics and communications uh, uh, in my BEng, And I got into the uh, space industry by working on a, a India's first eco satellite program. I was the systems engineer there. And then uh, we also launched that uh, satellite and then where I got to learn from, uh, from cradle to grave, basically the, every stage of the, of the project. And then I came over to UK to do my master's and uh, I also did my PhD, again, everything in space. Um, then I went to Kinetic uh, to work on ExoMars transceivers, then joined RAL Space in 2018. Uh, I've been leading this um, uh, satellite project that I mentioned. That's me. Great, thank you, Mamatha. And next, can we hear from Manny Shah, please? Hi, thank you, Susan. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, come from my perspective, I've always been fascinated with, with space ever since I was uh, very little looking up at the night sky and seeing kind of uh, um, just different, you know, just the beauty of it really um, uh, attracted me. And uh, but I never thought there was any career option. I, I didn't think the I thought the only thing you could do was be an astronaut, and uh, that's about it. I ended up uh, doing computer science at university, um, and again, I didn't get particularly good grades. So I looked at different options, and um, I really wanted to work abroad. So. I worked um, in New York uh, at an investment bank for uh, for a year, and then I came back to the UK and, and continued working in, in finance for a, a few years. Uh, but really, my passion wasn't there, and um, I was looking 
constantly kind of attracted to the space industry and I was looking at different options and I ended up um, uh, doing a master's at the International Space University in France. Um, it's a real university, I guarantee it, <laughs> and really uh, quite embedded in the space industry. So um, I, I got to meet lots of uh, very interesting people from lots of different backgrounds who have um, kind of uh, working across uh, different areas um, from engineers through to uh, uh, astrobiologists, um, quite a range of uh, ex experiences. Um, so after that, I ended up working at Inmarsat, which is a satellite communications company, um, and they help uh, provide connectivity to places, remote places like uh, ships at sea, uh, uh, planes going around the world and um, and other remote um, uh, situations. And um, my current job, uh, which is um, analyst at Bryce, so we work on a range of topics uh, for uh, com companies as well as uh, governments around um, how how is the market evolving, what are the opportunities, and how can, um, for example, the government help to grow the sector and, and help uh, uh, create more opportunities for uh, people all over the UK and uh, around the world. So um, at Bryce, we have got quite a, a diverse array of uh, uh, people, everything from engineers through to artists. And, um, and, and it just goes to show that, you know, you, whatever your passion is, you, there are opportunities in, in the space sector. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Manny. And last but not least, we've got Joseph Dudley. Hi there. Um, yeah, my name is Joseph. Um, like Daisy, I was always interested in, uh, in physics and maths at school. Um, but in particular, it was a competition that I did while I was at school uh, when I was about 16 that got me really interested in space. It's called the UK Space Design Competition. And it was all about uh, designing a future space settlement. And uh, so we, we got together over a weekend with lots of people from other schools, about 40 people in a team, which is quite a lot, lots of new people. Um, and, uh, and we had to design this, this settlement um, first in space. Uh, and then we did another one. We went on to the, to the international competition, which was at the uh, Houston Space Center in the United States. Uh, and there we designed a, a space settlement on Mars. Um, and I really, really enjoyed that experience. Um, like it, it was so much fun to uh, to think about how we might do these things uh, in space uh, in the future and the kinds of things that you know you and I might get to work on one day. Um, so then I, I went on to study aeronautical engineering, which is the engineering of uh, aircraft and spacecraft uh, at Imperial College, which is a university in London. Um, and while I was there, I got involved in a student society called UK Sense, which is a, a national society of lots of people uh, from all different um, subjects who are interested in, in space. Um, and I got really involved in that and I helped organize uh, lots of space events, uh, lots of uh, competitions. So we had a competition to do with rocketry, uh, model rocketry, if, if you've ever come across that, is really, really fun. Um, but also things like uh, a competition with mini Mars rovers. So we went to um, uh, RAL Space, which is um, a government uh, laboratory uh, where they're looking at things like rovers. And um, we use their Mars yard which is a, a recreation of Mars on, on Earth. Um, and, uh, and we had lots of tiny little rovers, each of them, you know, about this big, um, and, uh, and uh, competed there to uh, capture samples uh, that might have been left by um, uh, another mission. Um, so that was really, really fun and a really great opportunity to meet lots of other uh, students who are interested in space. Um, and a lot of those people are now still my closest friends. Um, it's a really great opportunity um, to meet people and to learn something um, and to get useful skills then that you can apply in your career. And I definitely do. Um, and towards the end of our university degrees, uh, my friends and I, we were starting to think about, you know, what, what might we do after graduating? Uh, and so we started Googling lots of things and we couldn't really find any good advice about careers in the space sector. You know, there's a lot of stuff from NASA, but that that's not very applicable when you're in the UK. Um, so then we thought, okay, we, we better do something ourselves. So we set up a website called spacecareers.uk, uh, and that is a careers website for young people interested in space. Um, I really recommend you take a look. There's lots of advice on there. There's lots of interviews from people from all different backgrounds. Um, 
And there's also opportunities to get involved in competitions and events yourself. And as I say, I, I really benefited from being involved uh, in a competition while at school. So I recommend that it's something you try and get involved in as well. Um, importantly, there's lots of information about all the different ways you can enter the space sector. So it's, you know, it's not just astronauts and rocket scientists, but you know, there are also doctors, there are lawyers, there are programmers, there are loads of different people uh, involved uh, in the space sector in lots of different ways. Um, and this is something I'm still really interested in. Um, so I now work for an organization called the Space Skills Alliance, and we look at how we can make space uh, an even better place to work. So one of the things we did last year was we surveyed everybody working in the space sector in the UK uh, to find out what it was they were doing and why they joined the sector and what their experiences have been like and how we can make that better. Um, so that involves a lot of data analysis. Um, so I'm the kind of person who, who has quite a lot of fun with a spreadsheet. Um, uh, but it also involves lots of talking to people about their experiences uh, to find out um, what, what their uh, time in the sector has been like. Uh, and this works really important because uh, the space sector is one that's growing really fast. You know, you've probably seen it more and more in the news recently. Um, and we need lots of people to work here. Um, and hopefully some of you watching today uh, will come and join us. That is the hope. Thank you, Joseph. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear um, about all your different routes into the sector. Um, some of you, like me, never intended to join <laughs> and got caught up in it. And some, you know, clearly had a passion from a young age. So um, I think also the thing um, that I kind of didn't realise, especially when I was growing up, was about the space sector in the UK. I just didn't, you know, I went over, I was lucky, you know, went over to Florida and went to Kennedy Space Centre and everyone knows about NASA. Um, but I had no idea what was going on in the UK. I didn't really even know about the European Space Agency until I saw the job advertised. And even when I started working for them, again, didn't realise quite um, the opportunities that there are available in the UK. So um, really interesting to hear um, from you all. And actually, I'm, I can see that Tom, um, Tom is our wonderful um, host from um, Ezero UK, which is maybe where um, the schools and the, the participants today found the um, found out about this panel. So Tom, can I also ask you, so we've had some really good um, <clears throat> uh, comments here already. Um, we've got space careers um, that Joseph men mentioned. Daisy also talked about the CANSAC competition. Um, Joseph also talked about the space design um, competition and UK said, so either Tom or Joseph and Daisy, if you want to put the links in the chat for the schools to have a look at, that would be really helpful um, so that we're not just talking acronyms and um, and people can have a look at those because those are all things that we can get involved or the students can get involved in right now. Um, so I guess that's, I mean, we've talked about the subjects that you might have studied at um, A-levels or Scottish hires or, um, uh, or elsewhere, but what else um, did you guys do outside of your school? We've talked about some of the competitions, but Mamatha, I know you did things other than um, obviously just your, your straight school and, and yeah. university. What, what I can directly relate to this is uh, when I was doing my undergraduate degree, I went to an international conference. So it is International Astronautical Congress that happens every year. And in that, that year, uh, it was in India. So I attended that and I was uh, listening to all these amazing speakers talking about space and that actually motivated me. But also what was much more interesting is that the then chairman uh, of Indian Space Research Organization opened up a competition for students if uh, saying that if students were to come up with a, a CubeSat or a EcoSatellite, they would support uh, on the technical side of things and also launch it for them for free. And so, uh, so a bunch of us got together <laughs> and uh, uh, started thinking about how we can uh, how we can build a satellite. Uh, although we were electronics and communication students and never had a background in space or anything, but it was pure research and spending hours outside the curriculum and uh, talking to the scientists. And, and so after a year or so, we got to a stage where we had a proposal to put into. And then uh, we went through all the different stages, like preliminary design reviews, critical design reviews, et cetera, where we, we clearly impressed uh, the scientists at the Indian Space Research Organization. And then, which, which was supposed to be a finally a project and turned out to be a real mission, 
And uh, so soon after our undergraduate degree, we launched this satellite on uh, Podma uh, Satellite Launch Vehicle from Indian Space Research Organization. So, uh, and that, that started that trend of building CubeSats in India. So we were the first ones and we have entered the national book of record called Limca Book of Records in India. So, uh, so that was the first time. And it's still the smallest satellite that students have built. So, uh, so that's uh, something to think about. I mean, how you can get involved in other things outside your curriculum, just that would help you learn more and and foster your uh, your career path. Because uh, because I had learned so much in my early ages, it helped me to become the technical leads on on projects and such uh, later on. Uh, yeah, that help. that's one of my advices. Yeah. Wow. That's fantastic. And Daisy as well, you, um, there's been some questions about the CANSAT competition that I know you took part in whilst you were still at school. Uh, I can't remember how old you were when you um, took part, but could you just explain a bit more about what you had to do for the CANSAT competition? Yeah, I think I was seven, maybe 16 when I first got involved with it. Um, and yeah, I was part of well I designed and um, manufactured the parachute for the CANSAT essentially all um, the CANSAT project is is it's a satellite that fits in the space of a tin can that's really all you need to think um, and then ESA sets out some uh, design requirements of the can so I didn't really have any experience with anything to do with um, actual mechanical engineering or electronic engineering or anything like that or design at all um and yeah weirdly enough my GCSE in textiles came in so handy and I designed and made this parachute and that was my job for the majority of CANSAT so for the UK competition uh, that was my role and then also for the um the European competition in the Azores once we got through to the second round um but I mean the opportunities that I got with it kind of never really ended um the CANSAT competition in the UK the people I met from that still today recognize me and I like there's CANSAT competitions every year so it's really worth doing these things because your name just gets out there I mean I was in a meeting yesterday and someone's like oh I recognize you from the CANSAT competition that was years ago and um I'm still involved the company I'm working for now B2 Space um, it's a really useful competition for them as well. They're looking to get involved with it and they want me to help out with that. Um, I met the guy I'm working with at the moment, Steve. Um, he was a judge at the CANSAT competition. It's such a small world. Um, I got invited to the 2019 Space Conference because of it. I've been invited to several um, talks and given several talks because of it, which has allowed me to make connections um, so yeah, it was like I had a part in the competition and I did have to give presentations and it was so much fun and I really did enjoy it. But the opportunities that I've had from it, I'm still involved with now. Like even this panel, I wouldn't, I don't really think I'd be doing that without CANSAT. Um, so yeah, it's so important to get involved in as many of these as possible and just provide these pos uh, opportunities to as many young people as possible. Definitely, that I'd say that's one of my biggest tips to getting involved in the space industry. Just do and get involved. Yeah, and that's really interesting to hear about all the different leads, as you said yeah. afterwards. And obviously, that's how you then um, went on to study what you did and found this um, internship. And that's when I met you as well. And that's, as you said, <laughs> why you're here today as well. Um, and I saw Joseph nodding your head along as well. So I think you might have um, a similar but different story about the UK Space um, Design Competition, perhaps. So um, could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I echo everything that, that that Daisy said about like the importance of getting involved in these things. Um, you know, the the uh, space design competition um, is sort of nominally an engineering challenge. You know, you have to design this um, space settlement, um, but actually, it, it involves all different uh, different parts um, of, of the project. So there's an aspect of of project management, just trying to coordinate lots of people, especially people you've only just met and figure out how to how to work with them. There's a presentation aspect. So at the end of the um, weekend, you have to present your um, proposal for it's, it's sort of as if you're bidding for a, um, a project, which is something that, you know, all space companies have to do. Um, 
and you present to a panel of judges, uh, many of whom are, are experts uh, from the space industry. Um, so there's a lot of that presentation skills as well. But in terms of the, the design, um, uh, Susan, you mentioned earlier that you um, were involved in what's called human factor uh, engineering. So looking at the role of people um, within these uh, projects. So one of the ways um, uh, that the competition works is that the teams get split up roughly into, into four groups. And uh, one of those is looking at human factor engineering. So it's not all sort of the, the physics um, and, and uh, you know, rocket propulsion side of things. And um, that is certainly one aspect. There's also um, an automation aspect. So, you know, if you think about any future space settlement or even the ones that we've got at the moment, the International Space Station, um, it involves lots of computers, it involves lots of electronics, um, and that's only going to, to increase, you know, a lot of um, what's involved with uh, spacecraft today uh, is not actually human controlled, but uh, robotically controlled um, and computer controlled. Um, so, you know, you don't have to uh, be someone who's uh, necessarily, you know, brilliant at, at physics or, or maths if actually working with computers is your thing or, or working with people and understanding those sorts of things. And as Daisy said, you can bring in skills from all sorts of other areas uh, as, as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and not just at, you know, that kind of age as well. So when I um, first went over to, to work at the European Astronaut Centre, I had, I mean, I'm sure you've all heard of imposter syndrome. <laughs> I really, really had it. I had thought, what, how did I get this job? What on earth am I doing here? And I just thought, oh my gosh, all these people are so clever. They're engineers, they're instructors, you know, they're teaching astronauts this kind of stuff. Um, you know, what on earth can I do to offer, um, you know, to offer my support? But obviously they hadn't necessarily had any training or development in all these skills that Daisy and Joseph are mentioning, you know, presentation skills and communication, working in a team, that kind of stuff, you know, <clears throat> incredibly knowledgeable about their technical areas, but bringing it all together and working with other people is just really, really important. Those kind of skills um, should not be underestimated. So um, yes, they were incredibly clever, but they still needed some some help. <laughs> um, and then Manny, you've also put, by the way, um, those listening, if you have a look in the chat, all those links to these um, competitions and things that we're talking about um, are all up there. And Manny, you've also mentioned the NanoSat design competition, if you'd like to um, explain what that is. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, this is a competition that is being um, led by Launch UK, which is a um, the kind of uh, body that's coordinating the launch efforts for the UK. And it's a coordination between UK Space Agency, the Department for Transport and uh, I believe CAA, which is the Civil Aviation Authority. Um, and uh, in order to encourage uh, more participation in the UK's space industry, and to inspire more uh, people to join join the industry, uh, uh, there is a competition that will be launching um, very soon um, in the next few weeks. Um, uh, this is a teaser; uh, it's not been uh, publicly uh, made uh, uh, announced. But yeah, towards the end of October, the, the competition will be launching, and um, and the the goal is to design and build a satellite that will be uh, launched from the UK. So uh, you can come together uh, to, to form teams. It is for people who are 16 and over, um, but um, yeah, I think there'll be more competitions in the future as well. So do keep an eye out um, for those um, as, they, as they get announced. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Manny. Um, <clears throat> so my next question is actually to David about your apprenticeship um, route and how you found going in as an apprentice and then also studying for your degree part-time whilst you were working for Clyde Space. How did you find, you know, the balance between between working and studying? So I think coming from even hearing it there, the imposter syndrome was really quite big. You go into a company full of engineers and all these people that are just amazing and everything and just say all these words that mean nothing to you and you just don't know what you're doing. So when I first came in, I started working in the stockroom believe it or not, so just handing out parts, doing bits for different builds and that sort of stuff, and then sort of progressed. So when I sort of got an understanding of what the difference between different parts are, and then sort of understanding about how, how a company runs from the ground up, and then going into sort of, here's one product, test this, make sure you're an expert at it, and then progress, eventually you get to the point where you can, you've got a whole arsenal in your repertoire 
but you, before you even realise what you're doing, you start to pick up all these things and you just sort of, it gradually just snowballs as you go on to eventually become an your apprenticeship for four years. And you're like, oh, I've done that, that's me, I'm, I'm ready to go. But I think in my mind, there's always like, I was always trained in electrical and electronics. And even then I was like, I don't really enjoy it. I enjoy doing mechanical things a lot more. So that's why I sort of went, well, I'm going to do my degree in mechanical engineering. And then my company said, yep, that's fine. You, if you want to work while you're doing it, that's fine. So I was working 34 hours a week and doing a 12 hour shift at university one day a week, which was not pleasant, but and all in all, I did. I worked with a lot of other people doing the same thing, and not all, I was only in the space industry. But understanding how all the different companies working came together was really sort of eye opening. And eventually, got to the point now where I've finished this year. I've just finished in July, June this year, and that's me done it completely. So now working full in mechanical team, doing design and parts, and doing custom bits for space projects and satellites. So. It goes to show from an 18-year-old coming with imposter syndrome, not understanding anything that's going on and working in the stockroom, just handing out parts to actual designing parts and working on satellites and doing things. An apprenticeship is often a, loop, a route that people sort of look down upon as being a, a fallback from not going into university. But in all in all, you complete it and you can always go back and always change. And just because you start on something doesn't mean that's a route you have to go for life. It's so easy just to, once you're in, to start. I thought, as uh, Joseph said as well, it's not all about once you commit to one thing, that's you. You can easily jump about and change and say, I don't really like this, but I really like that, and keep going. It should be the rest of your career, which is what I've done. Yeah, absolutely echo that, absolutely. And I think, yeah, not only can you obviously change like careers, but even in the same job or whatever you can, I mean, most companies nowadays will offer great training and development opportunities as well. So you can go off and do other things while still doing your job. And especially, I mean, doing a degree whilst you're, whilst you're working is fantastic. And congratulations <laughs> if you finished in July. That's really, um, yeah, really well done. Um, and yeah, I guess that also kind of brings me on to Manny, a question for you. Um, and please, people listening, um, keep popping questions in, as I said, either in the Q&A or in the chat function. Please um, don't let me talk the whole time as much as I'd love to ask these people all the questions. Um, what, um, yeah, sorry, back to Manny, kind of what opportunities for the more business side? Because we've talked quite a bit about the engineering and physics and the more, say, traditional routes, but you come more from the business side of the sector. What sort of opportunities are there um, for people interested in that side of things? Yeah, of course. Um, so I, I mentioned I did computer science in university um, and it was definitely a course I enjoyed doing, but um, I felt I was more uh, interested in, in some of the commercial opportunities and, and, and the business side. So, um, but I also enjoyed the technical and the engineering. So I was trying to find a way that I could do both. And um, after going to the International Space University, which is a very interdisciplinary um, masters that you do. So you cover off all of the kind of the science and the engineering, but also the humanities and, 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 and the, um, the other aspects. So, and the business. Um, and so I, I, I really um, enjoyed that. Um, and from there, when I went to Inmarsat, I was able to work in a, a central function that collaborated with the uh, engineering teams, but also the uh, commercial teams uh, to understand what are the opportunities that the uh, company can, can work in. And, you know, the space industry is always changing. So you need to be able to take a look out into the future and identify how you can, you know, uh, get involved with some of those opportunities. And those that can mean anything from, um, how do we grow our business uh, around uh, the aviation market? How do we um, uh, install, how do we get our uh, service onto some of the new airlines that are coming up so, um, and, and, and help grow the business that way? And uh, by growing the business, then you can hire more people and you can help to create new technologies and develop new capabilities. So it's that, it's that kind of feedback loop that helps to uh, expand uh, the innovation that's going on. And at the end of the, end of the day, it is the people that drive that innovation. So um, uh, you need to have a strong business to be able to 
to keep it growing. So um, that's why I really enjoy uh, kind of the business aspects. And uh, that's what at Bryce we do as well is help companies uh, to, to realize their potential and work with them on some of those uh, aspects. So, yeah, it's, it's always a, a, it's never a boring day or a dull day. Um, you get to work on quite a variety of uh, areas. Um, and topics so yeah um, I, I, if you're interested in those kinds of aspects then I highly encourage you to uh, take take a step and see if you if you enjoy it and um, because it does it's, there's no harm in trying it and then seeing actually if it's not for you it's not for you um, it's good to um, iterate and try something and, and keep keep experimenting so yeah definitely um and I guess that also like I know so you said you um about your degree in um sorry remind me it was in computer computer science, <laughs> computer science. <laughs> yeah and um so do you think even though you've kind of gone more to the business side of things do you think it was still important um to have and we we encourage in the space agency a lot when we're talking to youngsters about a stem um background at least you know for a levels and potentially if you're going to down the university routes with the STEM, obviously science, technology, engineering and maths. Do you think that's still helpful to have that kind of that background and those qualifications or would a business degree work just as well? Um, it, it is helpful in terms of uh, communicating with um, engineers and I think it, having that foundation is helpful but you don't have to have a, a full degree in a STEM subject to, to do that. You can do for additional courses, um, part-time courses. Um, and, and yeah, absolutely. Having a business degree, um, you, you know, the, uh, we've got colleagues who've got business degrees, arts degrees. Um, and, and so it, it's, it's also being able to pick up, pick things up along the way um, from working with people, uh, being curious about different topics is, is also important. Um, and uh, yeah, I think you can, if you've got the interest, you can learn a lot of things uh, quite quickly as well. Great. And Joseph, I know you've done a lot of work on this as well. So I don't know if you'd like to um, add your thoughts to the kind of skills required um, to work in the sector. Yeah. So uh, my organization did a, a bit of research uh, last year looking at the skills that are asked for um, on job adverts, uh, particularly for early career jobs. So the sorts of things that you might get um, after graduating from university or finishing an apprenticeship or, or something like that. Um, and one of the things we found that was quite surprising, actually, um, was how uh, how much demand there is for things like programming skills. So, you know, we typically think of space as, as being um, very focused on uh, more sort of aerospace engineering. So the kind of thing that I studied. Uh, but actually, we saw uh, programming skills uh, are really uh, in demand. Um, and again, it's because uh, so many things now um, have a, a computer related component to them. Um, so, you know, gone are the days when uh, you would be um, doing engineering by, you know, doing drawings uh, on paper. You know, now it will be um, computer aided design, as it's called, or CAD. Um, so that's a really valuable skill um, to, to gain. Um, and the great thing about it as well is that actually it applies to lots of different uh, sectors. So you're not sort of... Um, uh, choosing really soon which one you'll have to go into you can take those skills and they're in such demand everywhere um, that you can apply them to whatever whatever you like um, another thing that we found is that there's really high demand for uh, transferable skills so uh, as you mentioned earlier susan um, we've got quite a few people within the space sector who are uh, brilliant in terms of their understanding of, of math and engineering and and so on um, but uh, maybe lack some of those, um, you know, project management, team leadership skills, communication skills, which are really important. Because however brilliant a scientist or engineer you are, uh, it doesn't really matter if you can't communicate that to someone else. Um, and no space project is done by one person. You know, these are all uh, team projects. They're often team projects across lots of different countries. Um, so language skills, for example, very important there. Um, so it, it's definitely not just the case that you, uh, you know, you only need um, uh, STEM related skills, um, but actually you can get really far and have a really big impact um, coming at it from a, from a different angle because you think about things in different ways and you're able to communicate um, these uh, quite complex problems often uh, in a way that, that other people will understand. And that is vital for the collaboration uh, that underpins everything that we do in the space sector. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Um, and then I've got a question for Mamatha because um, I know Mamatha um, and I are both on the Women in Aerospace Committee. So I know Mamatha quite well, but I would like to know what you're, from your perspective, how inclusive you found the um, working in the space sector, obviously as a, as a, as a woman in the aerospace sector, um, how you found that? Yeah, sure. Um, so definitely we have come a long way, I would say, <laughs> uh, but we are not quite there yet. Uh, the reason I say that is, um, as for another talk, I was doing some research and, and what the statistics say is around 48% of the entry level employees are women, uh, around 30, 35% of the non-executive directors are women, only 9% of the executives are women and uh, coming to women in color or other um, backgrounds, then the numbers drop drastically. So it comes to like two to 4%. And uh, so, th so the, reason is, the reason I say there is still a bit more to go is that there is still difference at all levels and that's what we need to address. Um, and I want to be clear with the message I give you. It's not about providing opportunities because an individual is different and we need to increase the numbers. It is about recognizing that they are equally capable irrespective of an individual looks the same or not. And that's what uh, we are talking about here. And so we have a little more work to do, <laughs> but definitely it is much better than what it was before. Yeah, and that's really encouraging to hear, at least at the moment, for you said it for early careers professionals that it's 48% women. Is that your statistic? Yeah. So, Daisy, how have you found it coming in, <laughs> obviously, uh, as an early career professional? Um, have you found any any issues or have you found it? Uh, any um, you know what? I can't say I have. I think the only issue I did have was actually set more of the doubt that I was where I belonged um when I was in the cancer competition the first um in that sort of stage of my life and my career I didn't really feel again this is just imposter syndrome syndrome but I I didn't feel like I had the skills that all the lads had that were in my group did and I just didn't feel like I was that, that much of an important member um but actually I remember because the parachute didn't have many issues that needed to be changed once we'd got to the Azores in the second competition. And so really, I didn't, I didn't actually have that much to do when we got there. Um, but my main role was actually keeping everyone sane, really, like keeping up the team morale, because we were working, like, we hardly slept. I mean, I've never been that tired in my entire life. We were sleeping, like, on buses and anywhere we could. So it's it's all those soft skills again actually are actually what made me feel like I was worthwhile so and, and a part of the team and joining B2 Space um, as an intern and now as a full-time uh, in a full-time position in the UK team there's only two women and honestly everyone has been really inclusive and pleased about the fact I'm a woman joining um, I've definitely, I definitely found that we, we all work the same way. So as Mamatha said, it's, it, it's so, it's just all about how we can provide the exact same skills in the exact same way. Um, just from, just by influencing other young women into it by just even being employed. Um, and I think that's what's attractive to employers at the moment is, by employing people like me, I can inspire other girls to come into the company because, like I said, I'm, I'm one of two in the UK. Um, and it is a small company, but I, I haven't experienced any discrimination in that respect. Um, I've been very lucky, I feel. Um, I don't, I feel like the space industry in general is a very inclusive industry in that it's a very worldwide community. Um, there's, and, and that's just the nature of the industry. So I feel like for them to be uh, exclusive, if you like, it would be actually quite difficult for them. Um, so there, there are definitely areas that need improving. Um, but I think in general, it's a really inclusive industry to be in. That's really encouraging. Thank you, Daisy. Joseph, did, did your skills survey, sorry to put you on the spot, but um, did that um, touch upon diversity and inclusion issues at all? 
Yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, at the end of last year, we conducted this um, big survey uh, census of the, of the space sector. And one of the things that we looked at was um, issues like diversity. Um, and, uh, and we found similar to what my mouth was saying, um, that there are quite a lot of uh, women, uh, quite young women and uh, women in, in junior roles. And I think you know, that reflects a lot of the uh, work that has been done um, to get more people in, uh, people who have been inspired by things like the Hidden Figures um, film uh, about the, uh, the women involved in the, uh, the uh, Apollo moon landings. Um, and uh, at the moment, we're not seeing that at some of the, the higher levels. Um, and that's, you know, a, a combination of different factors that um, people being put off um, uh, back before a lot of these outreach things started, because um, one of the things is, you know, you make a change now and it can take, you know, 40 years before those uh, students that, you know, we're talking to today reach the, uh, the really high levels of um, uh, space companies. Um, but there's, you know, there's definitely uh, improvement. There is still work to do, um, but there is a lot of evidence um, that, you know, there are women all the way through the, the sector um, in lots of different roles, contributing in lots of different ways. Some of them are, are doing um, things that have been, you know, previously thought of as as men's jobs for no real reason, um, uh, and and like blazing a trail there, which is which is fantastic. Some of them are are, are in other roles as well. Um, so there's a there's a whole range. You know, there's not uh, any part of the sector that is you know this is women only or this is men only or anything like that. Um, so you know whatever. Uh, area um, you want to work in, you, you can, and there will be um, uh, other people there who are just like you. Great, thank you. And then I'm just conscious of time, we've got eight minutes left, um, but I've got a, a question for all of you, which is just a very practical question, thinking about our audience, um, which is, Obviously, you've, you've done your, your subjects, hopefully, at A-level or, or whatever the, ne the next step is, or thinking about university, etc. Um, but when you get to the point of your, of your looking for your first job, I'd just like to know from each of you how you actually found that first job <laughs> in the space sector, or maybe even before that maybe then led you on to working in the space sector. So how, how did you find your first, first job? Um, I'll just go around. I've got my math first. Uh, I think I briefly touched on this. My job was during, uh, when I was still a student. So that actually helped me to understand what I'm really, really interested in and uh, my passion. So so whatever you do, my, my advice is stick to your passion. I, I think when you stick to your passion, you you excel in what you do. Uh, it doesn't have to be space. For, uh, it can be anything. But if space uh, it is, then yeah, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. David, how did you find your first job? So how I found my first job in the space industry was by accident and reading the local paper, applying for an apprenticeship through a company. And then the company saying we have a space company looking for an apprentice. And then I decided that sounded very interesting and applied for that. And here I am eight years later. <laughs> I still think that's amazing you found it in the local paper. <laughs> yeah. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Manny, how about you? Um, yeah, I actually did a, um, a year in industry as part of my uh, university course, and um, uh, it really helped me to kind of understand if this was something I wanted to do after university as well. So um, I still wasn't convinced by that. Um, so that's why I, I was looking at other options after university and uh, the idea of working abroad really appealed to me. Um, and I came across this email that uh, was like a newsletter but I don't remember subscribing to it it was one of those and I was like um, and it said um, a year abroad experience in New York you work for a company and uh, you do a diploma part-time as well so um, I, I thought New York sounds fantastic um, wasn't sure if it was a, a, a scam but I was like okay I'll give it a shot <laughs> turned out it wasn't a scam thankfully um, and uh, yeah I had a fantastic experience and uh, really helped me to better understand kind of the the way the global business environment works um, and from there I was able to um, hone my understanding of, of the business aspects of, uh, of, of yeah of space as well which was my real passion so that's what led me to then go into um, ISU. Uh, and Daisy how about you where did you find the 
your first job? Um, well, I definitely, because I kind of asked, <laughs> I'm very much a, if I want something, I will go and look and get it and I'll just keep going until I get it. When I first realised I wanted to get into um, the space industry, my the pers- the teacher that mentored the CANSAT team that I was on um, did actually recommend Space Careers UK to me. And I did look on there. Um, I was I just looked every now and then throughout university and I did see that these spin turnships were turning up and I did think oh I'd like to apply for them um and yeah I I realized they were I got a newsletter through and saw that they they were open for applications so I applied to a few and then during the first week of my um spin internship I just said to the um I think I said it to a few people, but I just asked the CEO. I was like, I, look, I'm really enjoying it. I'm having so much fun. I don't really want to do my master's next year. I might defer it would be a chance that I can stay. And he just said, yeah. <laughs> so I kind of asked. Um, but a lot of these small companies, if you ask, they they are accommodating, especially if they can see that you're working hard and you're keen. Um, so I, I feel like it's it's a combination of me having a lot of confidence if you aren't asked, and also um just really pushing and you know being persistent yeah definitely if you don't ask you don't get uh, I will come back to Joseph but I just quickly to go back to Manny because I know you hosted um an intern was it one or two interns this summer um so just from your perspective <laughs> on the other side of the yeah. internship yeah um we've been uh, participating in the spin program as a as a company that takes on spin spin turns for for the net for now three years now um uh, for every summer and uh, we found it to be a fantastic way to really um uh, get interns to come in and, and support us but also so that they can grow and learn from that experience and and help them realize whether that is something they want to do and if not they can look at other options as well but it really is a great way for um, providing opportunities to, um, uh, you know, uh, to students and get get them engaged in the sector. And for us, we really um, are amazed at how capable they are as well in terms of uh, supporting us. Um, so, yeah, we we highly recommend that if you're able to, you know, take take an opportunity through the spin turn program, uh, the spin program. And um, yeah, we will absolutely be continuing to participate Fab. and then lastly Joseph how did you get your first job in the space sector and actually you probably want to give some advice um based on the uh, on the website that you set up as well about how other people could go about it yeah so I think the the if you if you count work experience as a first job um I think I I found that uh, just by just by googling I thought you know I I want to go and do a work experience thing this was while I was still at school uh, to do with uh to do with space like let me try and find one. Uh, and I found one at uh, the Rutherford Apple Laboratory, which is which is in Oxfordshire. I li- lived in London. Um, and so I had to figure out, I didn't really think it through that I would have to, you know, take a train. Um, and that was a little bit scary for, for me, you know, like going and, and doing a, a job and doing it quite far from home. Um, uh, so uh, I, I recommend thinking it through a little bit more carefully th- than I did, but I really enjoyed the experience uh, and I got a lot out of it. And um, and I think the most important thing with that is um, not necessarily whether it's uh, directly related to the thing that you want to do, but um, just that it, it, it teaches you something about yourself and what kind of work that, that you like. Um, and hopefully uh, through creating um, spacecareers.uk, you know, it's now a lot easier for um, the people who have come after me to uh, to find those sorts of opportunities. So there's work experience, there's internships, there's um, jobs, all sorts of stuff are on that website. Uh, and you can, uh, you know, have a browse as, as, as Daisy did. You can sign up um, to the newsletter. Uh, I think it's, it's also on uh, Twitter and Instagram and, you know, wherever, wherever you are, um, you can uh, subscribe to that and find out, you know, what jobs might be available uh, for you uh, in the future. Yeah, and I can I, I, like, I like your um your your story of uh, the train from, from London to Oxford. 
<laughs> so I was a bit older um, when I found the job um, uh, at the Astronaut Centre for ESA. Um, and that came up actually, it was part of the careers um, um, uh, support offered by the university. And I saw the job and I read through it, it was about 10 pages worth of job description. I just thought, oh my goodness, unless I've done like, you know, 20 years in this job, I would never have all these things, which is why I just thought, so I'll just try anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, I had a similar thing with, but it was on the plane from, um, from London over to Cologne with um, only my hand luggage full of all these books about space because I just had no idea. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I guess all different routes um, into it and, and yeah, finding that first job. I guess just to finish up then, we'll go round again. Um, but just what, what, what would you say to, I think most of the audience is sort of 14 years plus, what would you say to them? What do they really need to know right now at the age of 14 if they're interested in a job in the space sector? And um, we'll start with Mamatha again. Um, I would say just talking to or going to all these work experiences uh, and things like that, because as many as you can, I, I had a couple of them last year, actually, uh, who had who, who were very enthusiastic and who were ready to take up any kind of challenge. And they're so quick and they, they learn quickly, they do execute it quickly. So do as many as you can. And then that will help you to understand whether you like it or not. And if, you, if you're passionate about it or not. And learning about your passion early in your career really helps you to streamline where you want to go and what you want to do in the rest of your career. Um, yeah, so as a 14 year old, go and explore things, talk to people, go on work experiences. And stuff. Lovely. I'm actually going to go to Manny next because I know you've got to go soon. So Manny, what, what, do, these, what do these students need to know right now? Um, yeah, I think it, it's um, important to not be disheartened by, um, let's say, your first job or first few jobs because um, it's not going to be exactly what you might have wanted, um, but it's an experience and a learning opportunity for you to really understand um, where to go next. And, and you can kind of um, narrow the choices, as, as my math was saying as well. Um, so I, I'd say uh, be patient. The, the, this takes time and um, you, you'll, you'll get there. Thank you. I think also knowing what you don't want is just as important as knowing what you do want. <laughs> Thanks. And David. I would say the best advice to get is to go out there and just Google things. Google what you think you're passionate about. Google anything in your local area. As Daisy said as well, COVID is allowing people to work all over the world. So just have a th think. I might like to do this in the space industry. Google and see what you get. The first companies come up, email them and ask and see what they say. They might be, oh, we've got no people, but we know X, Y, and Z, and they can put you in the right direction. It all sort of, everything snowballs. There's not, nothing's linear. Nothing ever goes a straight line. It just seems to be, one thing leads to another, and that's thing you know you're working in a space company. Oh yes, <laughs> Daisy, how about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, like Melissa said, definitely just get involved in as much as possible, even if you don't really think it's applicable. I did CanSat because I was bored at lunchtime and I was a bit lonely because I'd just moved to a completely new sixth form, and just it's just provided so many opportunities um just get involved with everything even if you're not sure it's something you're 100 interested in i mean i was not really interested in building a satellite i had no interest in electronics or anything like that but i didn't actually end up doing anything to do with electronics um and i hated coding at university absolutely despised it i really struggled with it and now I'm working in a company and I code all day, every day, and I absolutely love it. Um, so apply things, even if you think you're not 100% sure. Um, try not to be too sort of blinkered into it has to be what I want. Because even when I started working on my, my internship, they said we kind of want to tailor this to be something you really want to do and you can make it your own. And a lot of space companies really like out their ideas and crazy ideas that you might have from another skill set so yes know what you want and yes apply for what you want but apply for everything um even if it's not something you're not sure about fantastic advice and last joseph 
Uh, I mean, I completely agree with everything that you said, especially what Daisy was just saying, you know, go out and uh, get involved in, in everything that, that you can find. Um, and it doesn't have to be space related. Um, I remember I did a thing at school to do with uh, the law. It was like a mock trial. Again, it, it, it teaches you useful skills about, you know, how to communicate clearly and how to think uh, clearly and, and like analyze text really carefully. And, and that, you know, is something that is transferable across whatever you do. Um, and maybe you'll find that you like it and maybe you'll find that that you hate it. You know, perhaps you're someone who's watching this today and thinking, eh, I'm not that interested in space, you know, maybe, maybe not. Give it a go um, and, and see what happens because, um, you know, it's a sector that's constantly evolving. Um, the jobs that we are doing right now, uh, us panelists, um, and that we're talking about, they might not exist in a few years, and something totally new might exist. You know, it, it, it's evolving so fast. Even uh, five, ten years ago, uh, a lot of the things that we've talked about today, today didn't exist. So um, it's it's not set in stone. And if you come and, and get involved, you get to shape it, and and that's really really exciting. Yeah, absolutely. There are so many small um, companies that have started up um, that, yeah, exactly as, as Joseph and, and Daisy said, and I'm sure Manny could <laughs> attune to that as well, um, you know, that you actually get to, to decide what to do. It's, it's great working for the big companies as well, but it's um, it's nice to be able to actually play a, a real part in shaping them from the beginning too. So I hope you've all found that really useful. I really want to thank our panellists. You've been fantastic. Um, really good advice. Lots of things I can take away from it too. <laughs> Um, so I hope that's been useful for everyone um, and thank you for giving up some of your morning to our panellists and to our audience um, and uh, yeah thank you have a, have a lovely rest of the day thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you.